Hello, my name is Gary Mansfield and this is the Ministry of Arts podcast where each week I'll be speaking to a different artist. Now let's begin by bagging these bongos. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Ministry of Arts podcast, which is 244. As ever, thank you to our Patreon supporters, without whom we would not be able to produce this podcast. And if you like what you hear and you want to support us in some small way, go over to the Ministry of Arts Instagram profile, you'll find a link tree drop down box where you will find links to the Patreon page and the merch shop. If that's not your thing, that's absolutely fine because this content is free for everyone. This week has been quite eventful. I created an installation at the Museum of the Mind, which is in the Royal Bethlehem Hospital in Beckenham, Kent. It's called Whispers of Paris, P-A-R-Y-S. It was created for a very good friend of the podcast, Alison Lapper, she of Mark Quinn's Fourth Plinth. And it is running alongside an exhibition that is supported by a charity both myself and Ali are trustees for, the Drug of Art. And it is an exhibition called Lost in Paris. Paris being Alison Lapper's son, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago at the tender young age of 19. So the exhibition is, um, as well as being about the relationship between Ali and Paris, but it's also between Ali's relationship with loss and grief and how she is handling, assessing and processing both of those. Her exhibition includes 11 of her paintings, two brand new portraits of Ali by Rankin and two life-size marble sculptures by Mark Quint, one being the one that featured on the fourth plinth and another with Ali and Paris. It is a very calming and poignant show. The installation, Whispers of Paris, is, as I said, in the ballroom. And we wanted to create a sort of sense of how she was feeling on on pretty much an everyday basis, dealing with the loss of Paris. It's a huge room and all of the furniture within is covered with dust sheets, giving that sense of vacancy. And at either end, of this large room are structures made of made of voile material almost floating like clouds with images of Paris randomly being projected onto this fabric like the dozens of memories that flash through Ali's mind several times each day dozens of times per day and that's what we've tried to capture and I think we've done very well in that process The private view is on the 7th of February and it runs until I think it's the start of May. So there's plenty of time to get yourself down there. And what else is going on from the top of my head? Oh, Dave Bonaguidi and Sticky Fingers have got an open call which which ends this week on the 11th of February, I think it is. No, the 14th. They are looking for artworks of A2 size that are just related to the theme of voting, the proceeds of which go towards bursaries to send a couple of lucky students, hopefully, to Camberwell Art School. Can't beat that, right? But go over and have a look at Dave's Instagram profile and you'll get all the information there. Real Hackney Dave. But back to today's episode. Today I'm taking you to meet Nicola Turner who for some time has predominantly worked in theatre design. I first saw her installations at Gallery No. 32's Winter Sculpture Park a few years ago during lockdown. And man, since then her work has gone from strength to strength. The materials she regularly uses are from organic dead matter such as horsehair and sheep's wool. She creates these eerie organic forms that seem to, that seem to envelop the environment they're in. I don't want to mention too much about Nicola's work because she does it far better than I ever could. So please, 
come and join me in my conversation with Nicola Turner. Hello. Hi, good morning. <laughs> How are you today? I'm good, I'm good. I'm doing this from home because I've just moved studio, so I don't have Wi-Fi in the studio yet. And where is home? So I live in Bath. Oh, yeah, right. we've Hello. just, we've moved recently because we sold our house and then bought an industrial unit. Nice. It was converted into seven artist studio spaces Brilliant. and a communal well space. So that's just getting up and running. Nice. <laughs> so I do have several questions that I ask each guest. Yeah. And the first being, how would you explain what you do to someone that didn't know your work? I guess I make sculptures, sculptural forms. I really enjoy um, doing kind of site responses in landscape or against buildings or against architecture. And the material I use is dead matter. So I collect it from waste material. So I collect horsehair from chairs and furniture and old mattresses and wool and kind of put them together. So it's um, fibrous. I sometimes describe myself as doing kind of textile art because I kind of stitch and kind of bind all these fibers together. And I'm really interested in how like the horsehair has absorbed the memories of its time in a chair and all the kind of secret conversations it's listened to. So I'm definitely in my studio and I'm surrounded by the kind of massive material. I don't feel alone. You know, there's lots of, I don't know, agency around me. Well, if it's older material, could I ask, is there a certain aroma to the material that you use or even your studio? Well, especially the sheep's wool. Um, yeah. You get a really strong smell of lanolin, which is quite a visceral smell. It kind of gets you in the gut and people either love it or hate it. <laughs> and I think, I think there has actually been research done about kind of the smell linking to kind of things in your childhood. So if yeah. those things were upsetting, you kind of, you know, get repulsed by the smell. Yeah. But it's... Um, I don't know, it's worse when it's wet. So I have people I have had people when I'm installing really concerned about the smell, but it kind of airs out a bit when the material dries out. <laughs> and as the material gets older and I use it again and again, the kind of smell wears out. And in fact, I think it was a smell that we'd have all been used to in the past, you know, because jumpers and what we wore before we wouldn't have been processed so much. Yeah, so they'd all, yeah. you know, some really natural organic jumpers still have the smell of lanolin. in. Yeah, and when, when I take the mattresses apart, I found one in a skip belonging to a neighbour. Um, and I think he had lived in the house for years and years, you know, had been born in the house. And I took the layer of ticking off the top and you could see the outline of a person in kind of dead skin cells. Because <laughs> kind of, we all lose so many skin cells at night. It was really quite kind of abject. Yeah, would, would that just be a part of it or do you... I guess clean it. or slightly process the material you're um, using I, I don't process the material so much when I'm working on a large scale because it's just impossible you know I don't have the time or the resources to do that but um I've started to make some smaller pieces yeah. which I then wash and process much more so um when I mean, you say smaller pieces how small are they um they are about 40 centimeters by 50 oh, okay. centimeters by um um, I've got an exhibition on in London at the moment at Stargrinch and there are um, five smaller pieces in, in that exhibition as well as two larger site installations. Yeah well if we can just backtrack where was growing up? Okay so I was born in Guildford and I grew up in Winkfield Row which is between kind of Bracknell Alaska until I was okay. eight and then my parents moved to Belgium so I then had um some years in Belgium, really, until I came back to college in the UK. So you had your your younger years in, in Belgium. How, how was the difference in life adjusting there? Can you remember as a child? No, I really liked it. And I, um, I guess since we were then, from the age of 10, I was then sent back to school in the UK. Oh, OK. Kind of travel back for holidays, you know. But it was, I really liked the kind of the international setting. It was the kind of centre of the European Union. So, you know, a lot of our friends out there were from lots of different countries around yeah. Brilliant. Europe mainly, I guess. Yeah. And do you still go back there or not so much? Yeah, I do. And I have, um, I've worked a lot abroad, like in Denmark and Germany and Spain and places like that. And I always feel very at home on the continent. I really like the lifestyle there. Yeah. Was there creativity in the home growing up? Yeah, my mother's a very creative person and would be endlessly making. She 
um, kind of trained in kind of fashion. So she was always kind of making clothes and then she moved to upholstery and she was like doing oh. upholstery. So I was used to the upholstery. Yeah, yeah brilliant. My, my father's less creative, but his father was an architect. So, you know, when I went to see him, he had all the wonderful planning. Yeah, you know, nice. Um, yeah, planning desks and all the old books on architecture and things. So where did our, the, the making of art, beginning in your world well I guess you know at school I really loved art lessons so in all the schools I went to I you know I can remember a lot of things I kind of painted and made and um I guess I kind of got really absorbed in in art at school and then when I left school I went to do a foundation course was the first thing I did after leaving school in art yeah and did you take that route when you left university? Well, interesting. When I was applying for the foundation, you had to put what you wanted to specialise on the form. And um, I had kind of influence, I guess, from my family and stuff, not to put fine art because they said, oh, you'll be lonely in an attic. You know, there's no career. <laughs> You've got to do something that gets yourself a career. And so Excuse I picked me. the box of theatre design thinking, well, I make you know, I make my own clothes. My grandfather's an architect. It kind of combines that space and clothes and everything like that. Yeah. So I ticked that box and then ended up going to do a degree at Central St. Martin's in theatre design. And from my degree show, got an agent who then, you know, so I kind of fell into the world of theatre, really. Yeah. And it was only, um, well, I went back to do an MA in fine art, you know, when I was 50. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. And it finally thinking, like, actually, you know, why can't I do what I want to do? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, so it, it took that long for uh, for you to have the confidence to go for it. Yeah. It's frightening, isn't it? Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's funny how those things are installed in you, isn't it? From, from an early age. We've had several people on here who've gone down exactly the same path. They, mm -hmm. they felt like they wanted to be an artist. Um, and the, the more, secure side from their parents has said to them to sort of do something that was halfway so a few people have done architecture set design that still had a creative side but it was sort of appeasing their parents as well yeah so when did you realize that you wanted to be an artist I guess um I don't know. It's hard. I guess it it took me a long time to actually have the confidence to say I am an artist. Yeah. So I guess having a career in theatre design and then when my, I have got three children and when they were younger and I couldn't travel abroad so much, I started to do design consultancy for kind of live work units and stuff like that, because I was kind of um, I've always kind of done up wherever I'm I'm living, you know, and I think um, it did it. It. I don't know. I probably even still find it hard sometimes to say I am an artist, you know, yeah. it was kind of something that I thought, go, I couldn't, you know, I wanted to be it so much. I, I thought I could never be it, you know, and then actually, you know, thinking actually, you know, why can't I go back and do an MA? And I really feel now that I'm doing something that I really love and that's part Brilliant. of me. Yeah. And sometimes I think, oh, do I regret, you know, my years of doing theatre? And I still do the odd, odd opera now and everything. But I think actually it has put me in good stead for my job now because I'm not scared of doing things at scale. And I know how to, you know, make things kind of stand up and health and safety and all the kind of things I learned o over the years working kind of internationally in theatre have kind of really enabled me to kind of, I guess move quickly, kind of following yeah. my dreams about kind of. So if if you uh, if your career has been set design, theatre yeah. design, <clears throat> excuse me, did you find it hard scaling down? Because your um, mind always thinks on a grand scale. I did life drawing always that got bigger and bigger and off the page. And I started to use wax, and I'd always then do just a section of the body. So I always have worked on a large scale even when I was on foundation I was creating things on a large scale and with theatre you also have to make the scale one to 25 models of what you want the oh, stage okay. to look yeah. like in the end 
So I was used to working kind of in miniature and on a large scale. And when I was on my MA, um, I also liked working very quickly. I kind of had to almost, it was like, how do I take my drawings off the page into 3D? And I was exploring different materials and I tried kind of straw and cow dung and plaster and thinking, I just want to work big in kind of a, you know, a cheap way that you can work big and quickly. And nothing, you know, it was all too kind of heavy and then it took too long to dry and, you know, nothing really worked for me. And then I found an old chair and a skip and I noticed it had a crack, you know, and the horsehair was kind of bursting out. So I kind of ripped it and released the horsehair and actually made a sculptural piece using the horsehair. And I, I just got really excited by it. I just found the kind of abject quality of the hair off the body kind of thing as well that you kind of feel attracted to it and also kind of repelled by it. And the way that I could um, kind of stitch it and form it, you know, in quite a large scale very quickly. And it was kind of really malleable and yeah. something also that I could carry very easily. You know, I didn't have to kind of, um, you know, ask people to help me lift things or move things. You know, it gave me a lot of freedom. So um, I then created, you know, kind of looked looked out for more horsehair and started from that. Brilliant. Well, it's a skip, someone, an artist walking by a skip has been part of so many stories on this podcast. Yeah. They come, they just walk past and all of a sudden it's that obscure thing in the wrong place yeah. that, that just pops into, yeah. into your mind and, and yeah, and solves that question. Yeah, I used to always cycle everywhere. So I'd always stand up when I cycle past the skip you know, so you get a better view in. <laughs> uh, yeah, like a seagull and a bag of chips to see what's yeah. about. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Taken of and, anything from a skip. <laughs> and, it's, and where did the organic form come from? Did it just come off of the page was, or, or where did it start from? Well, I guess maybe it's, it was my interest in, in doing kind of close-ups of, of the body and the kind of the soft forms of the body. And um, I actually um, got really interested in, you know, how the horse has such kind of agency in it, although it's, you know, a dead matter. So when I was on the MA, I actually went um, to an abattoir and spent the day at an abattoir wow. and asking you know, asking people like, so are they dead now? Or where, where's the point of death? And actually ah. nobody could tell me the point of death. And you still had the kind of the bodies twitching, you know, long past they'd been skinned and cut, you know, it was really a weird experience. And then actually my partner gave me for my Christmas present, a cadaver course as well. So I went wow. to Bristol and worked with this hand surgeon on these kind of taking these arms and hands off a body and then we work for three days on these arms and hands and over those three days they changed color they you know they were it was a living thing and I got really interested in how we're actually made up of masses of ecosystems you know we've got more non-human cells in our body than human cells so we're all kind of interconnected and which kind of makes the understanding of kind of in the horse hair you know the memories it's absorbed and I think there's even scientific proof now that you know if you have your grandmother's box and you say I can't get rid of it it's just my grandmother that actually we do leave trait we don't stop at the skin we do leave traces of on things we touch and spend time yeah. with. you yeah. know so there is um I got very into the book by Jane Bennett called um vibrant matter which actually is a lot about her research around hoarders and why people kind of keep hold of things and what you know what uh, objects have agency and things like that yeah yeah brilliant and which piece that you've created do you think has got the strongest emotional connection oh. to you or to others I don't know a piece I've done really um recently that was um, quite interesting it created lots of kind of conversations some kind of positive some negative and I kind of was um, I did a piece at Wells Cathedral in the chapter house called the uninvited guest from the unremembered past Brilliant and it um, wrapped up the column of the central column in the chapter house up to eight meters high I had to go in the end and I used a lot of kind of horsehair and wool and coir kind of an old found legs of chairs and tables as kind of these feet and it was, ended up being quite controversial you know I was told to change the piece I'd written about it and take out that the title came from a book about transgenerational trauma and oh, wow. um, 
What, how did that offend? I don't know. It was interesting. People kind of saw it as kind of demonic in a sacred space. And, and okay. you know, all it, when you look at it, other people see it as cuddly <clears throat> and soft. And, you know, so it's, it really made me understand that actually what people bring to their work is their lived history, you know, so their response is individual to your piece. And so, you know, different responses can be really dramatically different from what yeah. it kind of conjures up in their memories. You know, I've certainly had things passed down, you know, kind of traumas passed down to me. And I really like the, um, you know, it gives me comfort, I guess, making these. And I'm always kind of with my material, it's always like hanging on or clasping or kind of grabbing on for dear life kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. I think the kind of the energy of the way I put it together and the energy of the material itself and the power it has does give give across, you know, a strong a strong response in people. So, um, I, I, you know, I find it fascinating what um, what different people bring to the piece. And I've had some lovely comments that people have written to me, you know, afterwards about, you know, things it's conjured up in their memories or in their dreams or nightmares. Or... Brilliant. You obviously knew it was going to wind around that column. Yeah. But, but did you, was there adjustments made on site or did you just turn up, know what you was doing and, and place no, it? No, I always it? like... I always like to respond yeah. to the site when I'm there, but obviously working, that's a grade one listed building. So I had to kind of work out how I was going to respond to the column without damaging it at all, or kind of almost kind of giving it a really light touch. So I did, there were some um, kind of, I guess, some feet at the bottom and I did it like this. Um, so I pre-made a frame at the bottom so that I could wrap sheep's wool around the column to protect it and then attach this frame with legs that support. Yeah, like, like an armature of sorts. Yeah, like an armature. So that that I had pre-made. And then I just, I take, I pre-make tendrils, and then I take them in ton builder sacks and just have them out there. And then um, just slowly <laughs> twist them and, you know, bind them and then stitch them and just kind of just Brilliant. keep going until, until I think it's kind of there or I run out of tendrils. <laughs> your work does have a very different language when it's in an architectural setting or even on furniture yeah than it does in a natural environment mm -hmm. because in a natural environment that could be its natural home whereas yeah. in a in a a building it's it's almost invading and and shouldn't be there mm -hmm. well that's interesting nobody said that to me before i had an amazing residency last year in iceland where um, I went for a month to the Skaftfell Art Center in Sædisfjordor, right on the east coast of Iceland. And I didn't have any transport, so I just spent my month like in the fjord. They lent me a bicycle so I could kind of cycle down the edge of the fjord and walk up into the mountains and everything. And a couple of times I hitched out of town. But um, it was amazing actually searching for material there and thinking, oh, what am I gonna use? You know, having just gone with my suitcase. But actually, I found masses of wool being piled up about to be burnt. So oh, yeah. so I contacted the farmer. I mean, I found the farmer and with Google Translate, I asked him whether I could take this wool, you know, um, which I hope he said yes. But I think he said yes. And he showed me into a barn all stuffed with wool because it's really, you know, they really don't do anything with it there. They just kind of burn it, which seems wow. such a waste at this in this but they only shear them once a year and there's a they're a double coated breed on Iceland. So it's then very hard to process. Um, so I ended up making kind of tendrils out of the wool and then taking them up into the landscape and interacting with the rocks, which was really wonderful experience and taking photographs of them. And then I had an exhibition at the in the art center at the end. And then after the exhibition, they gave the tendrils to the harbour master because there was a, a British tanker that had been sunk in the war and was leaking oil. Oh, and yeah. wool, wool booms are perfect for soaking up oil that rises to the oh, surface. Brilliant. So um, it was a quite nice circular thing because when I got there, it was quite hard thinking, oh, how do you respond to this magnificent, majestic landscape, you know? But actually kind of working in all the kind of the crevices and hanging on to the sides of the rocks with the material is really interesting. It's quite amazing that someone who works with sheep's wool would find not on a barn full of sheep's wool just on their travels in another part of the world. 
I know it was I, I was pretty lucky. I was pretty lucky. <laughs> and one day I was right up on the top by this somebody had dropped me as far as they they could go in the car with my bags of material and then I'd walked up to this waterfall and these rocks and I had the weather was really bad when I went it had it was just kind of pouring with rain so there are a lot of kind of landslide risks and you could only go out like three hours a day and you know I was in this little window and I was right up and then they rang me and they said look the storm's coming we've got to come and get you and I said I'm still not down to the meeting point you know you won't be able to get me out here <laughs> And I was like packing up my stuff in this kind of pouring rain and wind. And then this Jeep came over the top of the mountain. Amazing. And just said, do you want to lift? And it was one of the people I'd got some wool off who then bundled me in the back of the car and took me Super. down. And the art centre thought, oh, God, that's it. whoever drives that way. <laughs> it's just like it was so random. I was Super. I had a lucky time there. Yeah. Yeah. Iceland's a, a great. I've always wanted to go to Iceland. And so, yeah, I'm quite quite envious of you uh showing over there and, and did it go down well over there yeah yeah it was really nice and it was really good to be able to talk to the other artists that were around in the village and um you know share share thoughts about your practice and I think it it made I like being there a month and being without any material initially made me kind of open up I guess to my own vulnerabilities so I felt I kind of learned a lot about myself and my practice while I was there there's a certain fear that you have to do something you know, yeah, of course. Residency. and I think actually getting you know I spent the first two weeks just walking I walked miles and miles just looking and walking and I think um kind of being vulnerable on your own in a landscape like that was really rewarding for me I think it kind of really as helped. a material the the sheep's wool that you used over there being a lot denser or thicker than than what you used to did it perform in a different way yeah, it was slightly stiffer. Yeah, it was more almost beneficial or less. I guess quite uh, slightly harder to work with. Okay. Um, because it was kind of like almost like a felted mat. I had to kind of really rip it apart. So I just wondered whether you um you ended up sort of organising a container of this wall to to come from Iceland back back <laughs> home or not? No, no. Yeah, I should have done, should I? But I mean, there's so much wool available here. Is um. There's a wonderful farmer who lives quite, I did a big exhibition at Shatwell Farm and she really liked my work. And so she's really supportive with um, giving me her fleeces, which is really Brilliant. great. So, you know, you, you can pick up again in this country. I think we've lost the skills of processing wool in a cheap way, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of really expensive to use and it's such a valuable product. It's um you know inherently fireproof it's you know it has so many benefits to it um we're talking about group shows there if there was you and five other artists past and present Nicola oh, what would your ideal group show be <laughs> well that's a really tricky one I don't know there are so many people I'd love to work with I was in a group show recently with the Bomb Factory Art Foundation um at Marylebone a new day a new dawn that was a pretty good dream team <laughs> And who was really in there? And I, actually, two of the people that were in there um, was um, Kat and Erica from the Winter Sculpture Park. And we'd exhibited two or three times at the Winter Sculpture Park together. Yeah. So it was really nice actually being an in inside environment together with them. That was good. I did an exhibition recently in London um, in this old house in Hackney, 195 Mare Street with Kate oh, yeah, McDonnell, yeah. Um, who also worked, we called it We Are for the Dark from a Shakespearean quote. And um, our work really sat well together, I think, in that space. And we kind of did different interventions around the house. I mean, it's interesting group shows, because I think when you're in a group, like an open, sometimes I get a headache seeing so many things kind of put so closely together. And it is interesting how work, you know, relates to other work, like is in conversation in yeah. a sense. And some works, really sit well even if they're completely different you know they kind of sit well together in conversation with each other and uh, other times I kind of find some rooms are too crowded it's hard to kind of see the individual work if you kind of put things too closely but actually I was on an MA on my MA I was also with um, an artist called Kelly O'Brien who does very fragile work with kind of glass and fungi and you know thin bits of metal and on the MA, I think they said like, oh, you could never exhibit together. 
you know, because I'm so kind of heavy and mass yeah, yeah. and and, has, and actually we did exhibit in a show with four people called Materiality. And again, that was a really lovely conversation. So I think they were wrong that, you know, our work wouldn't sit well side by side. Most of the time, work that is opposite to each other sits well anyway, because yeah. like you say, that, that makes a conversation. Yeah, yeah. And if you wasn't an artist, Nicola, what do you think you'd like to be? If I wasn't an artist? Well, it's taken me so long to become an artist. Can I stay as an artist? <laughs> okay. I mean, I went on a course after the MA. Um, you know, they gave you this two-day course about, you know, how to make being an artist financially viable. Yeah. And they suggested all these things we could do alongside being an artist, like working in a cafe or you could do, you know, all these different things. And I was like, you know, I've got enough other things that I can do. You know, yeah. I can be a design <laughs> consultant. I'm a theatre designer. You know what I mean? There are many things I've done in my life as jobs. You know, I, I want to know how to make being an artist financially viable, not not having a not second. just getting by on in life yeah 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 and having a second job to be to be an artist I guess sometimes I really love um space and response to space which I guess I'm using my love of that in my response to kind of old buildings I realize I've worked with a lot of kind of grade one listed buildings doing kind of site interventions on them so I guess looking you know uh, architecture has always been an interest as well, kind of how buildings are made. But I'm not sure if I'd be good at all the um, regulation, building regulations and all that kind of stuff. But I think, um, yeah, I've done many other jobs, so I'm going to stick with being an artist now. Nice. <laughs> and when when did you start showing your work? Well, I guess um, during the MA, we had some shows. So we had some open studios and um, we had some... Um, different shows through that and when I did my final piece I also put it into a um, there's a center of death and in Bath believe it or not and they had a conference called the um, is it called this um, on death dying and disposal an international conference and I actually put my piece in their foyer during the conference which was fascinating and met all this amazing people studying you know life and death and the liminal spaces in between so it was really useful for my research and then when I left the MA it's just a matter a process of just I applied for lots of things I can remember applying early for the winter sculpture park and it was kind of deep in Covid when I left and I applied and then they sent an email back saying can you install you know, in two weeks time. And I, I was thinking it was the year after because we were so deep in COVID. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I packed my my kind of car filled with all my material and headed up to London with all my own tools. So I didn't need to touch anything yeah. of anybody else's, you know. But um, I've applied for a lot of things. And I think it's um, in applying for them, you're also putting your work in front of the panel of selectors. So even if you don't get it, you know, those... Yeah, you're ingraining your work in someone else's in someone else's mind yeah yeah so you know it's always been good and then um you know sometimes one thing leads to another thing or you know from my work in Iceland I get I mean Instagram's been amazing for me because you put work on Instagram and then people see it and approach you to be in shows or you know to respond to different things so that's been an amazing amazing experience you mentioned the the, um, winter sculpture park there at the time when they brought that, the time that you're speaking of, yeah. that was a masterstroke for them, wasn't it? Because no one was allowed out, but you was allowed to go out and exercise. And yeah, they just sort of joined the two together at that time, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. No, it was amazing. It was brilliant. What was the work you put in first of all there? The very first one, I put this mortal coir and I had yeah. this kind of big ball of material quite near the, the house at the front in a tree. Yeah. But then, um, actually, I took the same piece then, and I it was in the Stone Lane Gardens show, and I won an award for it, actually, which was wonderful, because really? that opened a few doors, yeah. Is it hard to reuse the same piece? Um, no, I mean, a lot of the material I use again and again, and it kind of, it becomes almost like a shapeshifter. It becomes yeah, different yeah, forms yeah. in different spaces. So people often ask me, like, you know, if you're responding to that thing there, how can the same piece be somewhere else? But actually you 
you know, you just kind of respond. It's very important that I install the work by myself, you know, by myself. I do have people that help me sometimes, but you kind of install and then you kind of respond to the new space. So it can look quite similar. The piece at um, at Wells Cathedral then went to the Bomb Factory Art Foundation show, A New Day, A New Dawn. And so it was the same framework and the same bags of material. But again, it kind of just Morphed grabbed the building figure, in a different yeah. way there. You know, it was responding there to a concrete column that wasn't grade yeah. one listed, you know, so it kind of. And what have you got? coming up at the moment or on at the moment bearing in mind this won't be out till probably mid-january all right then you just have missed my sugar and sh so i've got so next year i've got um different things lined up some things are just in the process of finalizing exactly what they are i hope there's a really exciting thing coming up but i can't tell you that and then um an uninvited guest from the unremembered past is going to have another outing and it's going to be in a national trust house just south of um, Bristol at Tinsfield House in September, October. And I was on this um, uh, Sculptures Development Award with the Chapel Art Centre in Andover and Roche Court kind of collaboration. And there's an exhibition at St Hillier's in February. And then the the other things I've got are kind of just, you know, being finalised. But um, Well, I've got to say, if you finished, what was the year you finished your MA? I finished it in 2019, September 2019. And then we had COVID, so it was almost like... So year. you've, you've oh. properly hit the floor running since your, um, since finishing your MA, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's interesting what leads on. You know, when you do something, you kind of think, sometimes I think, God, who's going to see this or you know and some things work some things don't work you know better but the material is very powerful and I think it does have a powerful presence so I think the things that people have responded to the most are these kind of shape shifter site responses you know and that kind of seeing that mass of material I work closely with a collaborative artist called Claire Whistler as well and we do projects as Turner and Whistler she responds to the material, you know, while I, you know, I create the pieces and then she does this kind of performative response. And we've also included sound. So working with Jim Blackburn, who we made this electric octo bass, which gives a really, really deep, deep sound. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing getting those three elements together. We had the opportunity to work in the silo at Shatwell Farm, where I did a piece called Lapses that we did as Turner and Whistler and Jim came in with this electric octave bass and in the silo kind of the sound resonated and because there's only one entrance the smell of the lanolin was so strong it was like oh, this really visceral smell <laughs> with this deep deep sound that kind of got you really in your gut yeah. and then the kind of the darkness and the movement I think when we first put it all together and the three of us were all in the silo and we were started trying out kind of movement and sound it was a real creative coalescent you know it's just like yeah. an exciting day creating an atmosphere yeah yeah superb and where can anyone find what you're doing be it website or social media so i have a website nicola turner.art um and my studios at form ica which is this studio complex i've just started in bath and we're starting to kind of run yeah. events there so kind of artist talks kind of films, live drawing classes, open studios, workshop, that kind of thing. And that is um, slash, you know, forward slash ICA.com. Um, and, and Instagram is always good. Follow me on Instagram because I load up exactly what, you know, what's coming out um, on there. So I have Instagram. a very good Instagram feed, should I say, or could I say. <laughs> NicolaTurner.art. I'm doing an opera next year, working with No Fit State Circus, Death in Venice, which opens wow. in um, March at the Welsh National Opera, which is interesting. And I think, um, I mean, I do very few theatre works now, but actually, you know, a lot of artists do, like if you think of M Maria Bronovich, um, Olafur Eliasson, Anish Kapoor, you know, they've all gone into the world of opera. So I think sometimes... Yeah actually kind of I'm trying to kind of make my worlds merge a bit because the opportunity to create kind of sculptural forms on stage with a large budget you know with the music and everything can be 
you know, really exciting too. And of course, they can come out of the opera as well, can't they, and be yeah. shown elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, the best thing to do that any artist can do is merge the two worlds that they know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Nicola, that's all my questions are. So thank you very <laughs> much for your time. That's a pleasure. It's lovely speaking to you. Thanks very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Ministry of Arts podcast. It's a podcast that's produced with the help of the listener. And if you like what you've heard and you think you might be able to give a little support, there's two ways in which you can do it. If you go over to the Ministry of Arts Instagram profile, you'll find a Linktree drop-down box. And in that box, you'll find two links. One is called Buy Us A Coffee, and it's pretty much that. You can make a one-off payment the price of a cup of coffee. Or, if you're able and want to do it more long-term, you can become a Ministry of Arts Patreon where you can sign up to support us on a monthly basis and 100% of your support goes back into the podcast. And if you're not able to do that, that's absolutely fine. This content is free for everyone. But we would urge you to follow us on your socials and show us a bit of love that way. Either way, thanks for listening and see you next time.